Good morning. It's good to be with you today in this place. It is a great day to worship. It's been a good week and a good weekend. This is the start of a new week. Amen? It's not the end of the week. It's the beginning of the week, and we give the first part to the Lord. And I'm glad that you're here. If you are visiting today, we're really glad that you're here with us and pray that you'd feel welcome. And in just a moment, I think I'll give you a little time to shake a couple hands and exchange some smiles. I would call your attention to your bulletins. There is a page that is called Opportunities to Learn and to Grow and to Share. Probably the, the number one priority for the church as a whole is getting ready for Vacation Bible School, so please pay attention to that information specifically about registration. And there are always ways to volunteer and to help out during that week, which is coming up quickly. Uh, you can read this for yourselves, but is there anything else that anybody would like to lift up this morning? All right. God, we're grateful that you never stop loving us and you never stop giving us opportunities to come together. We are coming off a Memorial Day weekend where we remember the price that has been paid for us to come here in freedom, and we still continue to lift up the families who are remembering lost loved ones and those who are still prisoners of war somewhere out there. We know that you're aware of them, but we cry out to you in worship, and we thank you that you don't leave us and you never forsake us. You don't leave us as orphans. You make us into family. And that's what we are, your family. In your name, amen. Spend just a moment just greeting the people right around you, and we'll have Susie bring you right back together for uh, a time of worship. But don't go too far. You'll notice what's happening when we start playing. He wanted it. Got the right song? Thanks for inviting us. Okay, we can get going. Suze, we can get started. Suze, Bill. Good morning, Center Point. As you make your way back to your seats, remain Ready? standing and Ready? join us in our praises this morning. Ready? Bill? We're going to sing our hosannas and let our praises lift high to the Lord this morning.
long, but it prepares us for spending eternity with Jesus in his presence where we're never going to stop singing. So enjoy this song. Get the energy going.
for the lives that we have, for the families that we have, the friends, for the creation all around us, Father. We stand before you in awe of what you have given us, what you have prepared for us. And we are truly grateful. We honor you, Father, and, and pray that this comes to you just as a small token of gratitude that you will receive. I lift up those, Father, who are suffering today in many different ways. They're, they're hurting, they're angry, they're lonely, they're tired, and they don't know where to turn. And I pray that, that as we go out today in this world, blessed to be here in this space, blessed to know you, that you would open up our eyes to see those people and to offer you in some way, whether it be a smile, a hug, a shoulder, however you speak to us and say that they, they would be receptive to that, to you in the best way. Help us to be open to your spirit's leading. Father, we lift up the graduates, we lift up the kids that are going through testing this week, preparing for summer. We lift up the teachers, the administrators, and we thank you for all of them. And we ask that they would have a really blessed summer. Father, I, I pray now as we go to our offering time that you would bless the offerings and the tithes that go in the plate, that you would multiply it beyond our wildest dreams, and that it would go out into Washington, into Beaufort County, and into this world in ways that we can't even imagine and touch lives as only you can do. We are truly grateful. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. So hey, here I am over here. <laughs> I was all excited. I, I found my laser pointer and I was going to use it this morning and I, I had it on this tray and it's gone, like vanished. So later on when I'm doing this at the screen, you'll have to just imagine with me that there's a little beam of light going through here. If any of you just happen to have a laser pointer on you, I would be happy to borrow it. But that's not very important in the big scheme of things. We're moving forward with this, <laughs> this message series about discipleship, which is, which is it. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to claim salvation in Jesus and the work of the cross and the shed blood of Jesus and the empty tomb, then we have to consider what 
our response is to all that other than just thank you. Thank you is good, but a transformed life is what Jesus came to offer. And, and the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us with that and in that pursuit. And the other thing that's been given as a gift is the church. That we don't do this on our own, we do this together. We, we learn from those who have gone before us and we gratefully pass on information and lifestyle issues and good things to those who, uh, who come to faith in Jesus. Look at that. Can I have it now? It's right in my eye. Thank you, darling. You're good to me. Last week we talked about just the idea that Jesus calls disciples to follow and to not wait or take a whole long time deciding if we want to follow or not. We, we get a chance by the grace of God if we decide to say no, not right now. God will call us and give us another chance. Jesus will continue to pursue us our whole lives because for him, eternity with us is what he wants. And so the best idea, though, is that we just say yes, that we don't him and haw and think about all the other good things in our lives that we would like to invest in, thinking that Jesus is an add-on. Jesus is never an add-on. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and Jesus is the example that we've been given, and we talked last week about an imitatable life, a life that we can live well, that other people would look at our lifestyles, not at the sign out in front of our church, not because of the kind of clothes that we wear or the job that we have or the title, but just because somebody sees the lives that we're living filled with the Spirit, filled with fruit like love and joy and peace, humility and generosity, all those good things, and they say, we would like to learn from you about how you pull that off. Because there's a lot of anxiety there in the world. There's a lot of over-competitiveness. There's a lot of over-scheduled families. We have to figure out ways of training up a new generation that's not being torn to shreds by the enemy who doesn't want us to ever settle down and be family. And so today I, I call your attention to a teaching that Jesus gave. We'll find it in Matthew chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 22. Oh, my glasses are here. When Jesus came into Peter's house... He saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. <laughs> when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes, I think he said, Hey, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Hmm. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> hey, that's kind of a tough thing. Jesus seems kind of heartless there. Uh, and that's the point of this particular message in our series is the, the great privilege that we have 
when we come into the church, when we come into the family of faith through Jesus, but also the cost that we pay, the price that we pay for being part of Jesus' family, for being disciples of Jesus. I really do believe that we as human beings are wired for community. Do you agree? There's nothing sadder than seeing somebody try to live out their Christian life in isolation. Oh, I can go up in a tree and sit and enjoy the nature. That's okay, but that's not where you need to stay. Enjoy the nature, connect with God, and then go out and find some people to live life with. We're wired for community, we're wired for family, and when we don't have it, we know there's something missing. And so we will find it anywhere. It is right here in this room. We had a gang summit that the, that the police department put on, the sheriff's department, a couple years ago, and they talked about how, how these lonely kids in the streets, even in Beaufort County, because they want some family so badly and they want some purpose so badly that they're willing to join a, a gang and on their way into the gang, the initiation is to have the rest of the gang beat the living tar out of them almost to the point of death for the right to become part of this family who after that point of initiation will do anything to protect that person because they've done something that intense together, they've gone through something that life-altering that it forms a bond. That sounds awful, doesn't it? That sounds awful, but it sounds powerful to me. It's not completely unlike the spiritual act of us dying with Jesus so that we can take on new life in our baptism and upon joining the church family. There's something that we need to die to, that, that self, and then, then we can be given a new life. I've been reading up, trying to get prepared for the, the community around Cherry Point. As Susie and I are going to be down there a month from today. It'll be our first Sunday down there. And I want to know something about the, the mindset of Marines. So I'm reading a book about boot camp and, and how they teared these recruits down so that they can build them back up into a, a community, a fighting unit that's willing to die for each other. There's something about it that resonates with our human soul. It's exciting, but it's scary. You know where I'm going? It's exciting. It, it seems worthwhile, a cause bigger than ourselves that we would be willing to give everything for, but then what do we have to give up? And all the control freaks went, oh, dang. Can I say dang in church? The issue of discipleship that I want to talk about today is called the ability to calibrate invitation with challenge. A church that's all invitation, that just says, come on in, have a seat, enjoy yourselves, we'll provide everything that you need. All you have to do is sit there and come back next week. Uh, that's an empty, empty place. And frankly, young people aren't all that attracted to that. A church, on the other hand, that says, come on in here and we're going to work you to death until you quit and then we'll try to find some new people to replace you. That's kind of an empty place, too. Young and old people aren't into that. Who wants to be eaten up and spit out? But if we can calibrate that invitational quality about come on in and be part of who we are, what God is doing, but also get involved in it too, it's not just for you. This is for you to live out your life the way God intended for you to live out your life. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, we, we have people that would be willing to join up with us. And this goes with any of the churches in the community. There's a lot of wonderful churches in Beaufort County. They want to join up, but they don't know how. And we don't know how to bring them in. We really don't. And so uh, Susie and I have had some training through uh, 
a ministry called 3DM, I think you know that, and we learned about something called join up, which actually comes from the world of horses, and I want to use that, that term join up and a, a little illustration for you right now so that you can sort of understand by seeing something. I'm going to invite Susie to come up and she's going to bring at least two people with her. You don't have to do anything other than stand behind Susie. At least three. So that means Susie, two other people, the rest of you can come. That's the invitation. So far, that's not working very well. Here comes Brooke, all right. Here comes Morel, Here, okay, there's three, all right. That's all we need. Stand right behind Susie. Now, move away from me a little bit. <laughs> all right, what these are, are four beautiful horses. Imagine that. I, you're gonna have to, Stretch your imagination and think of them as four beautiful horses. They're a herd. They're a herd. And Susie is the lead mare. And I, I've just learned this from books and stuff. I, I'm not a horse person, but, but it makes sense to me. So let's just say this herd is open to more people, more horses. And I'm a horse that needs a home. I'm a horse that needs a herd. I, I've been living out by myself, and I, I don't know what to do, and I absolutely must figure out how to attach myself to a herd. And so the way this works, this join-up process, and I'm going to oversimplify it, but the lead mare, who's part of the community, who's in charge of that, who has the keys to that community, plays a little dance with me. Let's just say I'm, I'm the one who wants to join. What I will do is I will dare to approach the herd. And as I dare to approach the herd, not knowing if they're going to accept me or not, I suddenly get challenged by the lead mare turning toward me. And in the horse world, when a horse looks another horse in the eyes, that means, wait a minute, you've been challenged. And so I back off a little bit. But as I back off, suddenly the lead mare kind of shows a little vulnerability, and exposes the flank to me, which means you can come again a little bit. And so, all right, she's inviting me in. I got a little further this time, but I'm going to back off a little bit until I realize that challenge is over. When the flank comes back in, I get this far, I've gotten closer. The rest of the herd is kind of into it because they think I'm probably going to be a great addition. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> Eventually, what happens is the lead mare comes out from the herd and, and we make physical contact. And again, I, because this is my wife, I, we can do this. But we kind of make some physical contact and snip each other, I guess. And, rub against each other. She might get a fly off of my face. But eventually, if things go well, I can come in and be part of the herd. And that join up that happens in the world of animals, of herd animals, is something that we can be instructed in as people who desire to be part of the church family. Let's give our herd a hand. Great job, y'all. I can't wait to eat hay with you. Maybe a sugar cube now and then. <laughs> Amen, that's the whole... <laughs> no. But we get it, don't we? That idea of there's got to be some give and take when when we enter into a community it's this works at a new job this works at a new school this works at a new sports team anytime we want to enter into a new group of people they've got to give us a chance and the ones who are in leadership need to be the ones who open up the access and once that challenge 
is accepted and there's proof that, that the one coming in is willing to work really hard to become part of the team, then that vulnerability is shared by the entire group and then we can all move forward together. It really does work with humans. We are not herd animals, but we're people designed for family. And in the life of discipleship, if we're not after family, whether it's flesh and bone blood relatives or family that God creates through the Spirit, We've got, to, we've got to get some skin in the game to join, and we also have to be willing to have new people come in, which might flavor things and cause us to, to reconsider how we're doing things the way we have always done them. Jesus, of course, did this with his disciples. Jesus did this with his disciples. We see this right in the, the scripture for today. Last week, we read about Jesus saying, hey, guys, join me. Follow me. And we see that, that those fishermen dropped their nets. Two of them even left their dad in the boat to follow Jesus. That was commitment. They had to sacrifice something. They had to sacrifice a relationship with dad, at least for a while so that they could come and be with Jesus. Jesus even told Simon, come and join me, but you're going to have to give up your name, Simon, and you're going to have to live into the new name I'm giving you, Peter. Here we have, at the beginning of this particular passage, Jesus was brought back to Peter's house. And Peter's mother-in-law was ill, and oh my goodness, what are we going to do? There's no woman to wait on us. Back in those days, that was a thing, I guess. And so rather than just say, well, I guess we'll go to some other house, Jesus worked a miracle. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, and it says she got up and waited on him. Again, I don't know, that doesn't work probably so much in today's society, but in those days, they were so excited about it, and she was glad to feel well enough that she could serve them. And left and right now, at the early parts of the gospel, Jesus is healing people, and he's welcoming people, and he's forgiving people, and he is showering people with love and acceptance and mercy and compassion and kindness, and who doesn't want that? And then we get this other part. That says, "Hey, uh, if you want to follow me, forget about having a place to call home." <laughs> that must have been a difficult thing to hear, because there weren't any hotels out there, hotel chains, or there there weren't any camps. It was just, follow me, trust me. I got people of peace all over the place and we will enter their homes and they'll take care of our needs and we'll serve them. And he invited them into this, this lifestyle where they didn't know where they were going next. They didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. They didn't know what kind of a, a hornet's nest Jesus was going to bring them into next, but somehow the idea of being with Jesus outweighed the fear and the anxiety of that other stuff. Privilege and price. I have some space on the other side of this board. I want to write some things down. Before I say anything, spend about 30 seconds from your own experience thinking about the privileges that come with following Jesus in your own personal life, the privileges that come, but also the price that someone would have to pay from their natural state if they were to follow Jesus. 
we should be able to answer this based on our own experiences. I'm just going to write some things down and at the end. Let's see if you want to add to it. How about this privilege? Miracles. Hanging around Jesus puts you in proximity to his miracle working power. Is that a privilege? I think so. And with that, healings. When we hand the microphone around at the earlier service and at the 11 o'clock service, we do a lot of asking for healing, but I don't hear very many people saying, hey, folks, we need a miracle. <laughs> we need a miracle. I think we need to boldly ask for more miracles. Because it's, it's the privilege of being a follower of Jesus is that it just might happen might not be what we want, but it might just happen. How about just plain old great teaching? Can you imagine following Jesus around and listening to all the teaching that he gave everywhere he went? If the Sermon on the Mount is an example of the kind of teaching that he sowed into the lives of these people that were gathering around in crowds, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you follow somebody who is that wise, who had that, that much spiritual energy in the teaching? What a privilege of hanging out with Jesus. Yeah, we slept on the ground. But, <laughs> how about just love? And I'm going to write the word table fellowship, which is kind of a new buzzword in the church. Love and table fellowship. They got to be with Jesus around the table, just talking about life, just talking about the adventures that they had gone on, talking about the challenges, talking about the opportunities. What a privilege. We're going to have that opportunity today. So we invite you to the table. Not, not in my name, but in Jesus' name. So many people are starving for love. They have no idea where to find it. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. You know what I mean? Jesus' disciples know true love. and spiritual adventure is there room in our lives for adventure do we want adventure would we welcome adventure or does adventure scare us we'd rather watch other people be adventurous on TV and think that we're having an adventure Right? It's a privilege to be on a spiritual adventure, not just with Christ, but with a group of people traveling together, getting involved in adventures together. Now we're going to check out some of the price. And believe it or not, without the price, the privileges aren't as intense. They don't feel as amazing. They're not as helpful. The price isn't a bad thing. The price is just... Well, it's the price. They, they tell me sometimes if I want to give something away and nobody wants to take it. I was trying to give a bale of straw away in Smallwood for a couple of weeks. Nobody would take this bale of hay. And somebody said to me, if you charge 20 bucks for it, someone will come and get it. People know that nothing comes for free. I ended up throwing it out in the woods. One price is just flat out obedience. Who 
Who is Lord? Jesus is Lord. We have to take the crown off of our heads and place it on the head of Jesus, or if not at the head, throw it at his feet. Humbly. Obedience is a price that we must pay. Just challenge. Uh, there's a scene in the Bible where they've got thousands of people and they're all hungry and they don't have any food and the disciples are like, Jesus, what are we going to do? These people are going to be hungry and we don't have any food. And Jesus said, what? You give them something to eat. Hey, what? And then a miracle happened, right? Because they went for it. They were obedient, and the miracle happened. You give them something to eat. One day, there were 70 or so disciples, and he, he paired them up two by two, and he, he sent them off into villages. He said, don't take anything with you. Don't take a walking stick. Don't take an extra jacket. Just go and look for people of peace who will take you into their home and stay there as long as they welcome you. Hey, who's up for that? It's a challenge. You give them something to eat. You drive out the demon. You put your hands on people and ask for healing in Jesus' name. Wow. How about just... The expectation of participation. I don't want to write it all out. Participation. There's an expectation. If there's a whole bunch of young people that joined this church last Sunday, and one of the things they said that they would do is that they would show up, they would be present. Any of you here right now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'll pray. I will give money. I will be present. That's an expectation, and it is part of the cost of discipleship. Is not just showing up on Sunday morning, but just showing up in life. Showing up at work in the name of Jesus. Showing up in your family in the name of Jesus. Showing up at the place you work out in the name of Jesus. Showing up everywhere in the name of Jesus. Participating. Not letting everybody else live a spiritual life for you. Too many people, too many churches hiring staffs of people to be spiritual for the congregation and the congregation thinking, well, we're we're paying for you to be spiritual, so I guess go for it. That doesn't work. That's not what it says. I do appreciate my job. Keep paying. But, and here's one that probably will, will get you the most if you're anything like me. The price of following Jesus, I'm going to write it big. Con... Control. Have to give up control. <laughs> Ouch. Right? Ouch! Because even the most timid people, they still want to know what's going on. They, they want to be able to look in a book or listen to a podcast and get instructions about exactly how they're supposed to live their lives. There are a lot of people making a lot of money selling how to do it books. But for the life of discipleship, we're never, ever promised control. We're never promised even what tomorrow holds. Jesus said, don't worry about that stuff. Tomorrow will have to take care of itself, but live right now in this moment, and I'll give you moment-by-moment -moment instructions. Who's willing to do that? Nobody unless you realize you get this stuff. I'll give control for sure because of this benefit, not just to me, but to the world. This, this, 
price that I pay of basically dying to myself puts God on the throne in my life and, and allows the Spirit to work in me so that I'm actually maximizing who God made me to be. And it's that way for all of us who are disciples of Jesus. Amen? If we want to maintain control, then church is just plain church. It's a program. We can control that. We can write a curriculum for church, but that's, that's okay as long as that curriculum is spirit-driven and open to moving in the direction that God wants to move us. Anything else that needs to be in here? Just want to shout out a privilege. Just say, here, one privilege is, or a price is, before I move on. But that's fine. I'm going to have Butch put the invitation and challenge matrix up here. That's a fun word to say, matrix. That's a good sound, huh? Getting ready for music. I've already talked about this, so we're not going to spend much time on it, but thanks to Mike Breen and the good people of 3DM, we have this matrix that talks about the life of discipleship. We might just call it church, but it, it's more than church. It's our families, it's our small groups, our missional communities. Highly invitational. Don't you think that sounds like it would be important? We should want people to be involved. We should open up our lives and be invitational. We should show them our flank and say, come on. Don't you think we shouldn't be ashamed of challenging people? You know where much of the Christian church in the United States is? Take a wild guess. You might not be able to read it, but it says cozy and lazy. It's highly invitational. Hey, look at our website. Come on in. We want you here. And low challenge. I'm not necessarily saying that's what it's like here at First United Methodist Church in Washington, but much of the church that I'm aware of, the big church in the United States, is here. We want people to be comfortable. Unfortunately, that's not what Jesus called people to. And so we have to entertain even more, and we have to hire even more people to be leading and to get exciting. But at the end, people very easily walk away from that. Because what we are really, really wired for is an empowered culture where we can make a difference. Reading Barna research, uh, reading sociological research and the studies that are coming out now for the millennial generation and now the newest generation, Generation Z, or the little brothers and sisters and cousins of the millennial generation, they are interested in making a difference in the world. They want to make a difference in the world. And they understand that that's going to be a challenge. And somebody's got to be willing to challenge them. And I think it's, we're the ones that need to be willing to challenge them and invite them too. Don't just invite them. Invite them and challenge them at the same time. And that only works in family. That only works in community. We certainly don't want a bored culture. No challenge, <laughs> low invitation. We don't want to stress people out, lots of challenge, and we really don't even try to make them feel welcome. Who would even ever be at a church like that? Millions of people, evidently. It's really sad. Does this make sense? Do you feel in this? And it goes back to the way Jesus and his disciples were living.
I'm going to transition to the table now where, where we get a glimpse of how serious Jesus took all of this. I'm going to invite Susie to come. He was so serious about this and he was the kind of leader who, who would never, ever ask of his disciples anything that he wouldn't do himself. And the ultimate challenge is this. Will you lay down your life for your neighbors? Will you offer your life for a friend? Will you sacrifice yourself for the kingdom of God? And in the case of Jesus, the answer was yes. And we know that that's exactly what they were talking about right at the end when Jesus was saying that he was going to leave them, but, but that the Spirit would come. They had that meal around the table, that fellowship, and he took the bread and he gave thanks for it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this, and whenever you do, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. He said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for many. Drink this, all of it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as we utter and proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God. Amen. I invite you to come ready yourself. We will offer you a piece of bread and you can dip it in this cup. If you want to spend some time at the altar praying, you are more than welcome, but we have some music for you. But come, we invite you now. The blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Yeah. Blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Christ. Okay, for you.
Amen. Would you please stand and join us for our, our final song? We're going to sing Glorious Day, and we're going to remember the glorious day that we gave our lives over to Jesus, and we're going to celebrate that with this song. week and share your gloriousness with those that you meet. <laughs> that was not planned. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.